All right, I'll do a, a quick intro for John and then and then I think we'll get going and, and hopefully more people will join us as we as we go. So John Cal Calabria, am I saying that right, John? Yes, you please, are. Please correct me. John Calabria <laughs> is our speaker tonight. He is a lifelong naturalist and has been teaching mindfulness for more than two decades. He spends much of his time outside taking notice of nature's wonders and sharing his observations um, like he's doing tonight. Um, he also cares for more than 75 bluebird nest boxes, which I always just find to be a remarkable endeavor <laughs> and, and wonderful. It's like potato uh, chips, you just can't stop once you stop. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna, I think we're going to get going now and hopefully we have a few more people join um, as we do that. So John, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite you to share yours. Very good. Here we go. Well, welcome everybody and happy solstice. One of my favorite holidays, if we could supposedly call it a holiday, but the shifts, changes, and uh, more light on the way, as they say. Um, as the cold sets in, we find ourselves finding, you know, ways that we will prepare for the winter. And um, one of the main ways the animals, which are always, you know, preparing as well, is, is through migration. Some just have the sense to get out of here. So I put together a few slides and I hope to share with you some of my observations, um, things that I've studied and learned about. And I'm not seeing my slides advance. Here we go. So this is my dad and me down in Florida visiting my dad. Uh, he had the sense to um, take off as soon as it got cold. But some of other the creatures that we um with that we love and adore, they also take off and it's kind of somber when they leave. I, I always mourn the last hummingbird and I leave my feeders up longer than everyone else, hoping I'll catch some stragglers because they are coming down from Canada as well. They pass through sometimes. And I had some luck um, with some late visitors this year. So And uh, also the monarchs, uh, the butterflies, they disappear. Um, some of the dragonflies, which I didn't know, the dragonflies migrate as well. Um, some of them just uh, also lay eggs and find other ways to, to procreate, get their genetics to keep going. But I was fascinated that the dragonflies, they take off as well. And then we tend to think that, that all the animals are going south of us, but some of the creatures, um, we are the destination for migrators. And one of those creatures is the uh, juncos, who uh, this little guy showed up and they're this harbinger of winter when they flop around on the ground. And what I found out about them is, is they are uh, what we see here of almost all females they come down here and the male juncos stay up around Canada and their mating grounds and they duke it out all there all winter and, and protect their space. So when all the ladies come back up, um, they have prime, prime mating ground, prime feeding places. So again, what we'll, what we'll learn as we go through these slides is, is each of these creatures, each of these animals has uh, their own unique way of making it through and it's not just that they make it through winter, they show up in spring prepared to mate and continue on. So for them, winter is partly a rebuilding as well. Those are the animals that take off. And then we're here mainly to discuss the ones who decide to stick around like us. And we get our winter coats out and put our hats on, get the gloves and, we're, and uh, the animals are doing the same thing out there. I drove by this sign in West Concord and I had to stop, turn around and go take a picture because it's one of my favorite things is to slow down, 
And if you think of hibernation in the sense that's mainly what's happening is they're slowing down um, on so many levels, both metabolically and just all their daily activities just sort of dampen down. Um, and the main idea is to, to store energy. And some of the creatures will store energy in body fat, which I think about when I'm eating my peanut butter. But they also will cache food, like squirrels and, and the chipmunks will just put food away. And some of the birds as well, they're stashing their stores for the winter. About, uh, I don't know exactly the day, but I came out to fill my feeders and this guy was in my backyard. I didn't see him at first, I just walked right up. I was gonna hang the suet on the feeder and wow, less than I am tall, far away from me was this guy. And uh, I froze, I stopped and I tried to remember, what do you do when you see a bear? And the first thing is you don't run. <laughs> so I, um, I walked backwards as calmly as I could, went in the house and I opened the window and, and watched him destroy my bird feeders, tore them down. And he's just munching away. So I got a pot and a pan and, and I, I banged them out the window and the, and the bear just stopped for a moment, looked at me and then continued the feast. And I got it. Yeah, you're a bear and, and you're in charge here. So um, what the bears do is pack on weight. And they're the, one of the first creatures that I thought about when I, when I heard hibernation. But they actually, they're not really very good hibernators. And what I'm told is that they're too big to get their body temperature down like the smaller animals. So they do what they call a hibernation light, where um, they just sort of go into a semi-slowed state. They drop their body temperature, their heart rate comes down, and what they do is to basically live off their fat stores. And there are a few variables. Um, it could be a male or a female. It could be a female who is pregnant. And then there could be a female with cubs in the den, which they spend some time creating about a month or so before their, you know, their senses are to go hibernate they pack in moss and grass and make it really nice for themselves. And then um, they, they, they head on in and they just basically sleep. What I'm told is they're easy to wake up and it's not a good thing to wake up a bear because it costs them a lot of energy to wake up and warm up and then to go back into sleep. So if you're ever in hiking and you see a bear den, tiptoe if you can. So what I did was um, looked up their heart rates in a bear uh, heart rate normally is around 40 beats per minute. And I made a recording so we can get a sense of this. That's about half of the humans. Can you hear that? Yes, I can hear it. So that is 40 beats per minute. But when they go into their hibernation, they drop to about 10 beats a minute, which is this. Wait for it. So that's the slowing down of metabolism, which mainly allows them to store energy and to basically make it through winter and, and, and be healthy on the other side in spring. I love this every week, every not week, every year in, uh, in Alaska, they have the fat bear week, which is this, um, I'm not very familiar with football, but I guess there's a, a narrowing down of teams and there's the champion. So they do this with the bears um, and they watch them chowing down on salmon and basically preparing for winter. These are the brown bears. And this is last year's winter, Holly. And I don't know what she thinks about being an internet star in, in this shape. She'd probably rather be seen in spring, but here she is. And then this year was a male named 747 named after the jumbo jet. And he got so large as his belly drags on the, uh, on the ground. And here's 2020's winner. Hmm. So as we talked about bears, they're, they're you know, not the best hibernators per se, but these guys, 
the woodchucks they are, the masters. And they go from a heart rate of 105 beats per minute, which is much faster. This is when they're destroying your garden, chowing down all your vegetables, ruining your flower beds. They're just, they're, uh, they're doing what they do. They're really cute. When they go and in, do the deep sleep, they can, they can go to sleep for months. I have notes about how many months, not really sure. Let's see. Woodchucks sleep for five months. And there's their heart rate when they're, when they're in hibernation. This is called a jumping mouse and they aren't the mice that are around our houses. These are mice that, um, that live more away from humans. You can see their, their long jumping legs and uh, they're masters too. They drop into deep sleep and they're gone for months. And they somehow in their genetics, in their DNA is, is the wake up signal for them to um, come back in the spring. But the real masters are the bats. These guys can sleep for seven months and they have a pretty fast high rate. Where's their heart rate? The bats are 210 beats per minute. And when they go to sleep, they drop down to about 10 beats per minute. That's about as technical as I hope to get. I'll spare you a lot more of the details and we'll just look at some pictures and talk about the animals. One of my favorite things to do. So all the other animals you think about, well, not all of them, but, but the, the animals you see or might see their tracks, the skunks, the um, foxes, the squirrels, some of the other creatures, chipmunks included, and even the birds, they do what's called a, a, a torpor, which you technically could say the bears are doing. It's the lowering of the body temperature, lowering of the heart rate. But these other animals, it's more um, a temporary thing for a few hours in the daytime to ride out a storm. Uh, the birds tend to do this at nighttime. When it's bedtime, they, uh, they can drop it for, for six hours, eight hours maybe even 24 hours, but then um, they, they bring their bodies back up to temperature. And things like here, we have a porcupine who is in my backyard. I was very excited because I've never seen one of these till this year. And I'm told to give them their space. And the one thing they crave constantly, because um, I guess they feed on a lot of evergreens is uh, salt. They have very little low sodium in their diet. So what they're looking for when they come around a house is salt and they will gnaw on garden tools and anything that there might be maybe some sweat on, they somehow can sense that. So you have the opossum, our, our only marsupial that has a little pouch for the babies. Um, these animals basically stay active during the winter, but they're kind of shy. You don't see them very often unless you're really out there looking for them. The fox, of course, um, they stay active along with the rabbits, skunks, mice active. This one moved into a into a, one of my birdhouses that needs a little work. Very surprised when I open the door and two eyes looking at you like what? <laughs> so uh, there he is. And here, if you look up this time of year, um, you'll see the condos in the sky. This is the um, squirrel nests. And they um, basically a pouch of leaves. They crawl inside there, they draw lower their body temperature and they will ride out a lot of the, um, a lot of the rough weather this way. Sorry for the bad picture, but it was pouring rain and I saw this squirrel uh, fussing around underneath my deck and it turns out he was doing some improvements on his home. He was taking dry leaves out from underneath the deck, taking a big mouthful of them, he was just stuffing them in. 
and then running up the tree and hopping over to the next tree and, and doing some improvements on his house. And I thought, you know, us humans going to Home Depot, you know, similar time to do some maintenance. He probably had a cold night and said, let's, let's add another layer, you know, which made me think about years ago, I was over my friend Eileen's house and on her deck, she had some of those Tibetan prayer flags, which I don't know if you know what those are, but they're these cloth panels that is strung along a cord. And the Tibetan Buddhists believe that the wind carries the prayers away. Um, so they're called wind horses. So hers looked like a row of, of missing teeth where there were some of the panels were gone. And I've never seen that. I asked, what happened to your, to your prayer flags? And she said, oh, the squirrels are coming and they're tearing off the panels and bringing them up. Uh, to, to stuff in their nests. And she showed me with the binoculars, we looked up and you could see the colors in the nest where the squirrel had, had scoffed these uh, panels. So I took this to heart and now, I don't know if I should admit this, but every year I put out some cloth for the squirrels and um, they take the, the pieces of cloth and they take them up into their nests. And, I have this mixed feeling about, about interfering with nature and you know it's really not natural for them to have access to cloth, but it's not natural for me to be in my house and taking up space. So I try to give back a little bit. Anyway, he's here shopping and uh, dragged a piece of this old cloth up into his tree and uh, I find it oddly gratifying. So I'll share that. Here's one of my other backyard buddies. He's um, probably thinking maybe we should have gone down to Florida. And one of my greatest uh, joys here is this little camera I have that I can set up and it's motion activated and, and it can catch these pictures of the animals around my house. Sometimes I carry it into the woods and I leave it places. And it's like Christmas morning to go out and get the camera and load it on my computer and see what we got. But I think this guy knows because he shows off and he shows up a lot. And here he is, he looks like he's gonna nut and he's showing off his jumping prowess. So this camera is always loaded with pictures of this squirrel. Um, we'll see what's next. So I don't know if do you have any, are we gonna do questions at the end and how am I doing for timing? Cause I can talk all night. Oh, we've got plenty of time. Uh, we did have a question about hummingbird, which maybe you can oh. yes, please. pop in here, which is from Gwen. When did you see your, your last hummingbird? This you know, I don't remember the date. Fall. Oh, so it was, it was early um, fall. We had had some cold snaps. Um, Friends of mine, we, we talk and they had told me, oh, I took my feeders down and I really don't remember the date. I might have it on my calendar, but that would be kind of, um, every. I'm sorry, I don't know. But I, I'm sure I marked it on my calendar. Um, my old friend Ray has taught me that, you, you know these things and then you compare them year to year. But it was later than, and then I thought, and the, and the hummingbird showed up and, zoomed around where I was sitting. He had each of the feeders. I have five of them sometimes. And then visited the couple of the late flowers that were still there and then zoom dead south. It all happened so fast that um, I suppose that they can sense, you know, maybe there's some cold coming, but I don't know if there's a way I could get back to you on that, on the date, but yeah, yeah. I just ask you to to leave your feet is up. It doesn't hurt to leave them up a little longer than everyone else says. A couple mammal questions. What do chipmunks do in winter? And uh, do coyotes, where do they shelter during a storm? I believe the coyotes den. I don't know a lot about coyotes, but I believe that they do den, which means they have a, um, a indentation in the ground. Sometimes they dig a hole next to a fallen tree, then a lot of the work is done for them. Um, but yeah, I don't know a lot about the coyotes, but I could learn, I suppose. 
and my calendar. And as far as the chipmunks go, I had a, a, a notes on the chipmunks. They go down um, below the frost line, which I did some reading about. And we're about six feet here. They dig their little tunnels and they, they plug up the tunnel and they sleep for about three days at a time. And then they'll wake up and, and, and then they'll, um, they'll use the facilities, they go to the bathroom and then they will eat a little bit and then they will go back into Tapor and, and, and another three days or so. Their heart rate is about 60 beats per minute normally, which I have my recording. This is a little chippy. And they also go um, basically the torpor, they lower their body temperature about 40 degrees or so. And then um, it's about 20 beats, so about half. Enough of that. Um, so yeah, they, they, um, they know what they're doing. They stash food, they stash food, they stash food. You'll see them busy as a bee there. And then they, um, they'll they come out sometimes on a, on a day that somehow they sense it's warm enough or they just check, but they'll pull the little door off, stick their head out. And I've seen them in February about, and they'll, they'll be around underneath the bird feeders. And you'll just see their coat is a little tattered, dull and they look a little uh, like a bed body, you know, sleeping for a while. Does that, that answer your question about the chipmunks or could I go in further? That's great. We have a couple more questions, but why don't we continue with your presentation and we'll, we'll get to them at the end. Okay, I'm trusting you to watch the watch because I'm a, I will ramble. So uh, as far as the birds go, I hear a lot of people say, you know, oh, I saw my first spring, you know, I first saw my first robin, it must be springtime. But in reality, the robins, most of them, they, they stay put, they stay here. But they, what they do is they, they switch their food. They, of course, they can't dig up their earthworms, but what they will do is, um, is switch to eating berries, mostly. But they also are very good at finding where the insects have hidden. And we can get to the insects a little more later, but the, the insects are also trying to make their way and the robins know exactly where they like to hide. Some of the other birds as well. So they're popping around and they're finding enough calories to make it through the day into the night. They drop into topor, they, they lower their body temperature, they go into sleep and conserve energy. And then in the morning, they're just ravenous. So if you, if you notice in the springtime, sometimes you'll see um, the robins and sometimes the cedar waxwings will just descend on a bush that has berries and they'll just be eating like crazy. And uh, uh, the Stowe Library has a, a berry bush out front and it's notorious for just being full, full of birds, packing it in. So years ago, I did some reading on the berries and it turns out in the, um, in the fall, these berries are toxic and they have levels of, of compounds that just aren't good for anything to eat. And the birds know that after they freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw a few times, that the toxins are, are um, lessened to the point where they're edible. And that becomes basically survival food until the ground thaws and then they, they can find their foods. So this is, you know, it's a fine edge of, of whether they make it or not. And you know, nature is uh, nature lives in balance, and the sad truth is not everyone makes it, which that's difficult for me. I don't want everyone to make it. But um, here we have a couple of morning doves. They stick around, and here you can't tell without sneaking up with a stethoscope. Um, but they appear to be in topor, which is this dropping of energy. They're um, quite vulnerable. This one on, on the um, on the right is, is seems to have woken up. I don't remember where I took this picture, but I thought they're very vulnerable, but then I saw the brush. 
they're underneath this, this canopy of brush, which mainly means that a hawk couldn't really strike them. So uh, there's, some, there's some, some strategy here, a safe place to, to, um, to hunker down for a few hours and then they'll uh, have another feed before they go into for the, for the nighttime. Big fan of the bluebirds. I love them all, but bluebirds have a special place here. And um, I have seven of them overwintering with me. We're very fortunate. They've trained me well. They'll land and they'll just look in my window until they catch my eye. And I can usually tell what's up, and what needs to be filled, and what they're looking for. So when I, I hear from people a lot about, well, how do I attract bluebirds? How do I get them to come to my yard? And I always tell them, you know, the same way that you get me to come to your yard, if you put some food out that I like, then I'll come to your yard. So here I have uh, five of the seven and they're feasting on, on some, some food I'd put out for them. Um, quite interesting, the males have the more blue and the females have the, um, the gray on the back, less pronounced colors is typical of most birds. This is their hot tub um, communal spa that I have out for them. Um, there's a small little heating element. You can get these on Amazon or uh, the um, Ericsson's has a few over in Acton, uh, Ericsson's grain mill, if you want to do the local thing. Um, you basically plug it in to an extension cord and it's got a thermostat and it only turns on when it needs to. So it, it just pennies to, to run this thing. And if you hook yourself up with one of these, you'll be very popular in the winter. Um, mine used to be up on a table, but then I felt bad for the ground creatures and I, I lamented and, and I put it down on the ground and I keep it shoveled out for them. But I'll see all kinds of paw prints and then this year I have my camera set up on it and I haven't taken the camera in yet after the snow. So I don't know who's come for a drink. Um, let's see. This guy, this is the red breasted nuthatch, which I've never seen before. Showed up at my feeder, um, boy, I think back in October, this strange bird showed up, looks just like the white breasted nuthatch, but it has a red front. And I was trying to catch a picture of him, trying to catch a picture of him, and he kept mooning me. So I got this picture of this bird mooning me, and if anyone's giving me a hard time, I just email this to them and say, uh, there you go. But what I, I was um, reading the Boxborough Birders Digest, which um, it sent to me, and someone else had a picture of this guy. I think he's from the, from the Audubon site, so this is not my picture. Um, you can see the red here, but there was a notice going around that, oh, these red-breasted nuthatches have come because where they usually live, the food has been depleted. So this ties in with that moving southward of um, birds looking for food and habitat. But I was, I, I was kind of feeling a little full of myself that I noticed back in October, and then the notice went around in December. So if we pay attention, you, you really notice these things. Um, so they'll be around for a while. They tend to, to live on seeds from the, from the evergreen trees, but they're also very fond of suet and they have no fear of humans. So this guy will come within six inches of me when I'm filling the feeders. And uh, just is very interested. In what, what are these human beings doing? This is a picture I took back in 2015. Um, I don't know if you remember that winter, notorious, we got a 108 inches of snow. Um, storm after storm after storm in February mainly. And I had this band of, of wild turkeys that was living in my yard and they were really enjoying the, um, the heated bird baths, coming for drinks. Except what they would do, unfortunately, is they like to soak their feet 
in the bird bath, so I'd have to clean it out pretty often. And then go out there, and there'd be a turkey standing there, and, and you're not supposed to put your feet in the water. So uh, they didn't really got with the program. But I did with the snowblower. I made a ring around the house, and this band of ladies would would love this this trench, and they just go around the house and around the house, and you could also almost tell what time of day it was by which which part they were like a clock and they were following the sun around the house so of course a uh, little bit of a sucker for the animals I put a little bit of food out for them and it's not really recommended for wild animals so very sparingly I, I treated them but they did come and partake of the water so the fondness this year for a pair of cardinals, or actually the second year now I've known this pair. Here's the male. Here's the female. And um, been my, well, I'm not a very good birder. I don't know a lot about the particular birds. I've just been observing them all my life and, and love them dearly. So this couple moved in and again, I've known them about a year. And back in the fall, they disappeared. They were gone. And this female comes, or would always come right at dusk, right before, right about now. She would show up and then she would eat her fill. And then you could just barely see her with the dark setting in and still can see there's a bird there. And then she'd fly off. And I learned all her favorite foods, um, mainly the safflower plant, um, safflower seed, the little white seeds you see in the mix. So I took a little, a few of these white seeds in the spring and I planted them. And every time the, 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 they tried to grow, the squirrels came and mowed them down. So out of like dozens of these little seeds I put in the ground, I got one safflower plant to grow. And it came up and it bloomed. And I babied this little plant and she made one flower. And then I kept feeding and feeding and, and taking care of it. And she made seeds and I collected the seeds and I had one little palm full of safflower seeds that I grew for this one bird and I couldn't wait to put them out and they disappeared, they were gone. And I waited a couple of days and she didn't show up for dinner time and I'm like, I had these seeds for her. And I grew them and I slaved over this plant. Uh, so I, I reached out to my friend Ray who knows a lot about the birds, he's an old man. And he said, don't worry, they'll be back. And another week went by and another week went by and it was at least at least a month I had not seen any sign of them. And I thought, you know, something happened. And things happen out there. So I just when I was about to give up, um, they showed back up. And here they are sharing a little meal. This is more um, a springtime nurturing move where the male cardinals are very known for um, just feeding the female, feeding the babies, and they've even been, saw, even been seen um, feeding birds of other species. They're just so um, nurturing, um, which is not the, not the norm in, in the bird world. So um, I told Ray, my, my cardinals are back, and he said, told you. So, so she should be here anytime. I wish I could show you. This is a pine siskin, which I had identified as a, a female um, purple finch and was corrected by the experts. So I am not a, not a very good birder per se, but I've seen more of them this year and they're sort of like the red-breasted nuthatches. They're traveling in a band and these bands of birds will move so some of the birds we see have come from up north from Maine and Canada and some of our birds have gone down to like the Carolinas. And in the spring, things will shift back. And this band of birds is just moving up and down, following the food, following the weather. Um, way to tell is the beak is different and there's a little bit of yellow on finches, I'm, I'm told, but I might have that mixed up and I don't claim to know. But I know for sure, this is the pine system. Here they are. There's the junco on the right, female junco. This is Dee Dee, I call her chickadee, who lives in the backyard with a bunch of them. And But she in particular is very curious about what I'm doing. 
She's always there when I'm filling the feeders and she'll even land on me once in a while. I'll hold my hand out. I'll say, here you go, Dee Dee. And she'll land in my palm, take a seed and then fly off. And it's better than hitting the lottery to have one of these little birds land on your hand. Um, yeah, and they're not, it's not difficult to, to, to train them and have them train you to stand out there with a palm full hand of seeds and eventually they will uh, trust you enough. So she's nosy, anything happened in the yard, she's there. She's always there. And here she always invites herself to a party. Here's the bluebirds feeding and she landed and they all stop what they're doing and like, well, what are you doing here? She took a seed and flew off. Very cute. So onward, how are we doing for time? Oh, we've got a, a little time left. Um, can we do a, a few quick questions? Yes, please. Before please. we dive in. So Lynn has a, a question. Um, are, are the birds at your feeders always this, the same birds? There's some that you seem to recognize, maybe others not. Well, if you, if you watch, if you pay attention, they have personalities. Um, a lot of the birds that land in the feeder, I don't know them as individuals. Um, um, but some of them, they just behave in certain ways that you recognize them. I'm gonna dip this light a little bit. You tend to, to, to see what they typically do and especially something out of the ordinary, like, like the other chickadees don't um, have that curiosity of what I'm doing. They don't follow me around the yard. They don't land on me when I'm filling the feeders, just this one. And I also watch her interacting with the other beings. There's some curiosity in this bird that she's gotta know, or he, I don't know how to sex a chickadee. Could be a he, but I just have this, this inability to use it when I'm talking about a, an animal or a living being. So I, I put a gender to everything including musical instruments and um, so interesting question, but yeah, I don't know. I would say that they are territorial. I'd say that they have a range that they move around in. So we're probably seeing a lot of the same birds, but they also um, will chase food. And if, if they're not liking what's on the menu, they will go to your neighbor's yard or they'll go to a different territory. They don't mind packing it up and taking off. And they might for a while and then come back. So there's been some studies of migrating birds that show up here and they've been found. There's people who tag birds and, and monitor them. And I haven't, uh, I, I don't know if I could do that um, to catch them and, and all of that. I just wanna watch them. But they've been, been uh, monitored to go way past where they're gonna live. And they basically scout out what's, what's further north and they don't know whether this is for future knowledge or what if, what if my nesting site fails and I need to move on, but they're very curious. They will, they will do a little Lewis and Clark expedition of what's, what's further, and then they'll come back and pick their territory. And they're much more territorial in the spring with mating season, there's a lot more at stake. Um, they tend to ease up with the intensity of, of chasing other birds off after the mating, after the eggs, after the babies are raised. There's a lot more mellow this. So I don't know if that answers the questions. I can say that um, I know some of the birds and most of them I don't. They're, they're, they've chosen, chosen to be anonymous and I, and I, I honor that. So. That's great. And then just one last quick question on the birds. Do you know what type of plant um, had the berries um, that the birds were waiting for them to freeze and thaw? Oh, you know, I do not. I'm sorry. I would have to ask Google. And That's I would okay. have to ask, I would have to ask Google and I would have to check, you know, four or five or seven or eight different sites because there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of things that are, the bigger the internet gets, the more you gotta like check your sources. Um, but yeah, if you read up on that, there's also, stories of um, some of these berries in the spring can be fermented 
and you'll see drunken birds. There'll be this, this flock of birds that have hit the berries and uh, there's an intoxication that happens and they'll be flying into trees and falling down. And um, there's some evidence that the, the other creatures will seek out these, these um, special berries. And yeah, so I wish I had the answer. I don't, I don't know what that little bush was, so. That's okay. So we've got probably, let's take another 10 minutes of slides and then we'll, I wanna leave a little bit of time at the end for any last minute questions. Oh, wonderful. Um, so on where we go from the birds into um, what's called brumation. Um, this is more for reptiles, which technically they're called ectotherms and we call them cold blooded. And what that basically means is they, um, they don't maintain a body temperature like we do. We have a little range of, of temperature that we can live in. Where uh, reptiles, they are the temperature that it is out or what they're on. So people who keep reptiles as pets, they usually have a heat rock, a little heat element that's plugged in or a heat lamp and the animals will hang on under it. They become uh, the temperature, the ambient temperature that they're, they're in. So as far as evolutionary sense or this way of being, they don't have to expend the energy that we do to maintain the body temperature. They can just be the temperature that it's at. So they don't have to take in as much um, nutrients where we need to constantly feed. They can, they, some, of these, these, some of these creatures can live a year without taking any food in. So um, there's all these different uh, ways of being that have, that have come forth. Here we have the snake. Um, it's very fond of the area where the safflower flower was growing. Um, this is full size. The snakes will borrow underground and find a place that, that hopefully doesn't freeze. So they'll use old um, animal dens, um, chipmunk burrows, whatever, sometimes underneath a log or something. They're looking for a place that's gonna stay somewhat steady in temperature so that's not up and down, up and down. We have a, a frog, wood, wood frog, I believe, who, um, this is an interesting story. I had this, this compost delivered and I had a tarp over it and I was moving this compost a few buckets at a time. And it was a big, a big hill of this stuff. And every time I'd pull it up, there'd be this frog and back to the individuals, as far as the birds go, I knew this frog, this frog was an individual and I'd pick up the, the, the top to get some soil and there he'd be. Um, so as, as it got closer to the cold, uh, I was worried about these, these animals, like are they gonna try to, to, to live underneath this tarp because it's just not enough. It's not enough protection. The snow is gonna come and squash them. The snow plow is gonna hit them. So I, I really was concerned about the, these animals. There were also some of these salamanders who were, were um, liking the digs underneath this tarp. So I did some research. I'm like, what am I gonna do with these creatures? And this is something, uh, well, that I, I lose sleep over. It's like, they're under my watch, they're in my yard. How can I help? So uh, I read up and they said, um, the internet said, you can create what's called a hibernarium, which is um, you dig a hole and then you put a, a, some sticks over it and then you put some, some leaves and you create a little a hole where they can get in and out and you create a, a little bunker for them, which they'd normally dig on their own. And then I could relocate these creatures to this burrow and cover it with a heap of leaves and, and wish them the best. And so I dug my hibernarium and I, I put a log over it and I, I spent some time with this. And the relocation day came and here I was, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? And well, I'm doing my best and my intention's pure. So I pull the top up and I'm like, okay, it's moving day. And they were gone. And it was like, Phew, it's not on me. So they know better than we do. They know better than the internet. They know better than, than me for sure. They, they realized it's time to go and they went and they, they found their way. 
the turtles, here's some painted turtles. Um, they were sunning themselves and I cruised by in my kayak and they didn't have to jump in the water, but they were a little concerned. What is this? And what are you doing here? And I was able to get this picture. Um, these smaller turtles, they will burrow underneath the mud and sometimes underneath the water and find a place to, to stick it out. Um, they will lower their body temperature a little. Well, they actually, the temperature of the water is what they are. Um, but one thing I didn't know is that turtles can take in some oxygen through their butt and they can exhale through their butt. So their posterior here. And um, they make their way. I'm told some of the bigger turtles you can see moving underneath the ice, like the big old snapping turtles. Here is completely unrelated picture. I read about these um, butterflies that have evolved to drink the tears of turtles. And I was able to find a picture and here is a, a butterfly drinking the, the tears of a, a turtle. And I thought that it was like a country Western lyric or something. I don't know what I was thinking, but I, I needed to share that with you. I befriended some frogs and back to individuals. Um, this is a stream that was part of my pandemic therapy was um, to walk the length of this road just about every day. And about two thirds of the way, there was this little stream. And on the way back, I would sit by this little stream. And every time I went in to sit by the stream, I hear plop, 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 plop. And with all these frogs fleeing, oh my God, there's a human, I'm out of here. And they would flee in the water. So I found that when you enter the woods, you, you, it's good to announce yourself, to move slowly, to use a soft voice and, and ease in, to not just verge onto the scene. And it's something I've done for a long time now, but with these frogs, I slowed down even more. I announced my presence and I went and I sat down. And it got to the point where they got to know me and they no longer jumped in the water. So I could walk very slowly and I'd talk and I'd say, hey guys, I'm here. And, and, and I'd sit down and I'd just listen to the brook and I'd forget about everything else. And the frogs, once they accepted me, they'd get a little closer, they'd turn, they'd watch. And I don't know if I should share this with you, but I have my phone sometimes and I would, um, play music for them. And I would pick a song and, and I'd put it on and I'd, I'd play the music for them. And then after this became more of a, a every few days to every day, and then I'd, I'd bring music for them, more of them gathered. And I just, I don't know if there's, it's possible, but I think they told, you know, a friend told a friend and they told two friends and so on and so on. This, this gathering of frogs, you know, three or four or six or seven start to be there and, and they're partial to, to like John Denver or something like that. So here's one of my frogs. This is a wood frog, uh, not my picture. This is a wood frog that is um, frozen solid. And they're one of the few creatures that actually this is their method um, of surviving and competing is they find a little place where they're not going to be stepped on and they sort of snug into the leaves and then they're at the mercy of the elements. I'm told through nutrition, through the sugars in their body, their liver can make antifreeze sort of, and it protects the cells from, from bursting. I guess the ice is sharp and can hurt the cells. So the, these creatures, these wood frogs can freeze solid and then thaw and then freeze solid and thaw over the winter. And it seems to be because they can do this right near the vernal pools where they're, where they're raised and where they were raised their young. And they'll be the first ones to the pool, the first ones for the choice spot to lay their eggs. And it seems to be very successful because there's a lot of wood frogs. I'm not sure if they're in danger or not, but, um, but if you do go onto YouTube, you can see um, time-lapse videos of them thawing out and they thaw out from the inside out not from the outside in which is very interesting but something in them is triggered by I don't know it's how much light comes in but they know it's time 
their heart starts to beat, the warmth spreads out through their body and uh, they hop on into the pool and they do their thing. Any questions about the, the, the uh, reptiles? I can move on. Um, we're into the insect world here. This is called diapause. In the insects go through their um, ways here. So this is a, one of the native bees. And the most bees of the native bees, how they survive is basically only the queen lives and she burrows down and holds onto her eggs until it's time to come up and to rebuild the colony. Um, this is pretty late in the fall, so I'm assuming it's a queen. She's moving very slowly. I gave her a little food, a little sugar water, and breaking the rules, um, but she'll burrow under the ground and, and, and ride out the winter. This is a bald-faced wasp or hornet, they're called. And he's eating a little bit of honey that I put out on my railing. Uh, lots of creatures come for this. At night, the moths come. Um, but it allows me to, to, to be a little closer to them. These are the woolly bear caterpillars. And they um, will burrow and freeze solid and then come out of their diapause, their word for hibernation, and uh, become these majestic moths, the wolf moth. Onto the honeybees. This is a picture from a hive. A dear friend of me helped me set up um, at the last place I lived. And where I live now, there's just not enough sun, I'm told by an expert. And I'm looking to find a way to, to resolve that. Maybe might be going up on the roof with a hive. So the bees, the honeybees, aren't native to where we live. They're brought in from Europe uh, many, many years ago. So now we assume that they're native, but um, they have an interesting way of surviving the winter and thriving in the winter. They form a, a ball. I'm told it's like the size of a basketball or a soccer ball inside the hive. And they've stored honey all around this ball. And the ball is continually moving and what they're doing is they're flexing their, their muscles that they use to fly. And this generates incredible heat where they can keep the hive 90 degrees in this, this ball of, of living things. And the queen's in the middle and all the bees on the outside are constantly moving inwards and all the bees on the inside are moving outwards to take their time in the cold. They'll swarm like this, swirl like this until it warms up. And when the queen gets the signal, somehow it's time to lay eggs, they go a little faster with their wings and they bring it up to exactly 93 degrees. And that's when she can lay the eggs, lay the brood for the bees that will continue on in the spring. So it, it's quite fascinating. You could study bees your whole life and, and still will have their mysteries. But somehow the queen knows in the fall, it's getting colder, it's time, she'll lay special eggs for special bees that can live the whole winter long until it's time to lay more eggs. Um, I think I'm nearing the end of my slides. I have no way of seeing my slides and what's next, but I, I put in a whole bunch of things here. There's an interesting quote that um, I'm still digesting, but one way of looking at the winter, it's, it's um, nature getting ready for spring, basically. And I had to share with you my friend Ray. Ray is in his, his mid nine early 90s. Um, and he he's lived in his home for, oh, I don't know, 78 years or something. And when I go out to visit Ray, uh, we keep our distance. I have my mask on. Um, but he's fascinated by nature still. He, he's mid nineties and, and we walk around his yard and he shows me all the plantings. I put this in back and, and he knows every, like the year he put this bush in and what it is and he knows the Latin name for it. And then a bird will land and he'll notice the bird and he'll say, 
oh, that's a, and then I'll know the name for the bird and all the habits of this bird. Here he is with, on the right with this yellow birdhouse. This is one of his original birdhouses that go back, it's older than I am. Um, it's probably almost 60 years old, this, this bird box. And it was completely falling apart and we were able to uh, uh, build a whole bunch of new ones. But I, he doesn't know this, and I don't know if he's on this call or not. So, um, but I saved the front of this box, and I'm looking to build a new box and integrate the old front, which is still solid enough, and into a new box and gift it to him. So, I don't know if he's on the call. It just blew my surprise. So, um, what I'd suggest is if we could learn a little bit from the animals and not so much get through winter, but find a way to, to thrive, to, to live that quote, that it's a way of um, um, staying in love with life, you know? So it's get out there and there's a lot to notice. There's such beauty. And, and if you look for it, it's there. And if you study the animals, you'll know the individuals and, you know, hopefully we all uh, arrive in our 90s like Ray here again with that smile and the twinkle in the eye and, and the excitement for a day and you know, out in the yard and taking care of the creatures. So, yeah, I don't know if there's any more. Let's see. That's all, folks. I'll go back to the berries. Does anyone know what this bush is? Maybe you could. Uh, tell we had someone suggest that it's winterberry bush. Um, and I, I know that winterberry can do that. I don't know if this particular bush is winterberry that you have a picture of. Um, mm. So if anyone has, we'll try and wrap up at five, but any last questions, pop them into the chat. Um, Don, that was really great. Program. I took up the whole hour with my yapping. <laughs> We're gonna leave a whole half an hour for questions and blah, blah, blah. blah. We, we did questions <laughs> scattered throughout. <laughs> so that was really <laughs> lovely way to celebrate the solstice and and uh, hopefully folks are had a nice time getting out in the snow this weekend and we'll do so. There's a star event happening, day. isn't there, that you were gonna tell us about? Yes, yeah, so tonight is the um, Saturn and Jupiter conjunction. So if anybody, I, I don't know actually how clear the sky was, but they're passing each other in the sky tonight and we'll be able to see them close together in the sky, I think for, I would, I would guess another week at least. Yeah, they're supposed um, to be so close, they're almost touching, but they're actually right. 450 million miles apart. But um, from our right. perspective, our little speck in the universe. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, we have a request to pull up the quote again from oh, Edna. I can figure out how to do that. Oh, escape. This whole, this whole Zoom thing. Bryn helped me incredibly to navigate the technology here. I really appreciate your help with this because um, who knows what would have happened if I was on my own. Does that help with the quote? Yeah, great. Hmm. I see a couple of familiar faces. Hello to my yogi friends. Hello. Hope to see you more. And if we have to do the Zoom, we'll do the Zoom, but hopefully we can see each other's faces soon too. Hmm. And, and um, I wanted to pitch a program that, that was on just, was it last week? Bryn had this, this, this couple who were talking about feeding the birds and it was fascinating. Oh, yes, yes. I uh, when, it live, but there's recordings of these yeah. talks that you can find if you want to review anything. Yes, yeah, so Gwyn Loud and Ron McAdow gave a presentation about bird feeding um, and that's online. You can go to our website, lincolnconservation.org and there's a link to the recording there. Um, and just to, to wrap up, um, we do have a couple more virtual programs lined up for January and February. And again, you can find the information for those on our website. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions. So I think we'll, we'll call it a night. Thank you again, John. This is really oh, wonderful way to uh, slow down <laughs> and appreciate. 
Same Samantha. time tomorrow. <laughs> the next day and the next day. I'd love to see you all, but we'll we'll have something soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks all. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.